It was supposed to be an ordinary day. One moment, I was getting ready for my shift at work and then the next thing I knew, I got a text for an emergency alert. The text read, Emergency. Heavy rains with possible floods imminent. Do not leave your home under any circumstances, effective immediately. Lock your doors and cover your windows. Avoid making loud noise or using devices that emit light. If your household members have been outside in the rain, do not let them inside. Await further notice from the authorities. This was weird, to say the least. First off, the weather outside was fine. I was outside just prior to receiving the text and not a single cloud was in the sky. And then the instructions themselves. They didn't make any sense. Don't let your family members inside if they'd been out in the rain. Before I could process that thought properly, I heard drumming of the rain on the roof of my home. I glanced out my window and realized that the previously sunny day had now turned into a sudden downpour. The drumming that I had heard on the roof became louder by the second, until there was the only sound permeating the house. Despite my skepticism at the instructions of the message, I decided to abide by the rules and pull the blinds over my windows, as well as lock my doors. I returned to my living room in order to send my boss a text that I won't be coming to work, but upon my attempt, I realized that the message could not be sent. Not only were the services off, but there was no internet either, so I couldn't check what was going on in the news. I wanted to turn on the TV, but I remembered what the message said about light emitting devices. So I did the only thing that an internet deprived person could do at the moment. I took a nap. The rain was loud, but the drumming of it put me to sleep more easily. I woke up some time later, confused and groggy. The battering of the rain hadn't let up. If anything, it was only more violent now. I glanced at my phone and realized that it was 5 p.m. Still no service or internet. I got up and I went to the kitchen to grab some water. Still half asleep, I poured water into a glass and brought it to my mouth. However, something stopped me before I could take a sip. In addition to the heavy rain outside, I heard a distinctive sound of footsteps splashing in my backyard. It was brief and sounded like someone just ran from one end to the other, but it was definitely there. I scanned my backyard through my back door, but it was empty. I was sure that I heard footsteps, so I decided to open the door and peek outside. As soon as I did so, the already loud thundering of the rain became even louder, almost sounding like a waterfall was next to me. I stepped forward to the edge of the grass and right away saw fresh footprints across the lawn. They started from one end of the fence and ended all the way across the lawn on the other side. It was as if someone had jumped over the fence, ran across my backyard, and jumped again into my neighbor's yard. Hello? I foolishly called out, looking at my neighbor's fence. No response came back. Of course it didn't. Maybe it was the neighbor's kids who got caught in the rain and decided to hurry back home. I turned around and I went back inside, closing the door behind me and someone muffling the noise of the rain. I drank the unfinished glass of water and returned to my living room. Just as I was about to sit down, I heard another noise. A group of voices coming from the street. I could barely make them out due to the battering of the rain but they spoke loudly to each other, so I could just barely hear them. I peeked outside my window and saw a group of armed soldiers standing in the middle of the street, in front of my house. They were talking among each other and from their body language and hand gestures, it was apparent that they weren't chatting about everyday, mundane activities. I wanted to know what was going on, so against my better judgment, I opened my front door and I stepped out onto the porch. Report back after a full sweep. I came outside just in time to catch one of these soldiers shouting. As soon as they noticed me, they pointed their guns at me in unison. Whoa, don't shoot! I raised my hands instinctively, 
I just wanted to know what was going on. Sir, you need to get back inside right now, the soldier at the front who was shouting orders earlier said. And then something happened that I cannot comprehend to this day. As these soldiers stood there pointing their guns at me, something flew through the street at an impossible speed and grabbed one of the soldiers at the back, taking him along with it and disappearing out of sight. It all happened in a split second, and all that remained of the soldier was his gun that fell on the ground with a muffled clatter. I felt my hands and jaws slowly drop and my eyes widened as the soldier who was at the front continued barking orders at me. The others seemed oblivious to their squad member's disappearance until one of them glanced to the side and saw the gun on the ground. Hey, Lieutenant, where's Ramirez? He asked. The whole group turned towards the gun on the ground and started looking around for the soldier and shouting his name. I wanted to tell them what I saw, but I wasn't even sure what had happened myself. One of the soldiers pointed down the street at something that I couldn't see from my porridge, and when their whole squad looked in that direction, their look of confusion turned into one of palpable fear. They pointed their guns at whatever was there, and just as I was about to strain my neck to look at what they were so worried about, I was ordered by the lieutenant once more to get inside, this time a lot more violently. I would have ignored the order itself, but the demonic, high-pitched scream that suddenly came from down the street is what caused me to run back inside, lock my door, and prop it with my back, while my heart pounded like crazy, even though I had no idea what the heck was going on. Gunshots were mixed in the air along with the animalistic screeches that now sounded like they were right to my ear. A moment later, both the screaming and the gunshots ceased and the only thing that remained was uh, the drumming of the rain. My heart was pounding fast, and my thoughts racing a million miles per hour. What the hell just happened? Before I could process that thought entirely, there was a knock on my door. Sir, you can open the door, it's safe now. It was the lieutenant. Safe from what, I thought to myself. I stood up and I stared at the door, holding my breath. Sir, open the door, the soldier said again. Something didn't seem right in the way that he said it, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Sir, if you don't open the door, I will be forced to break in, the lieutenant repeated. There was no annotation in his sentence, it was just as if he had read it off a line of paper. Sir, I am warning you. His sentence cut off and the sound of gunfire echoed somewhere in the distance. There was a sound of violent splashing footsteps moving away from the door, which I assumed came from the lieutenant. I glanced through the peephole and sure enough, he was gone. But the sight in front of me is what made my heart drop to the pit of my stomach. Strewn about the street in front of my house were the mangled and mutilated dead bodies of the soldiers that I had just seen. Their blood washed away by the pouring rain. I counted the bodies and my suspicions were correct. The entire group had perished. I felt guilty and stupid for disobeying the alert instructions like that. In my skepticism and lack of understanding, I thought it was a simple rain warning and decided to carelessly move about my property. Now those soldiers were dead, and I may have had part of the blame to take. I tried to push that thought out of my head and to figure out what I should do next. I checked my phone again and there was of course still no signal. I made sure my windows were covered properly and I turned on the TV. I flipped through the channels but none of them seemed to work. I quickly turned off the TV out of fear that I'll attract more of whatever the hell was out there. I went to the storage room and I fetched my dusty old radio. After putting in the batteries, I turned up the volume and started fiddling with the frequencies. Static, static, static. No, wait. There was something on one of the frequencies along with static. There were voices in the background, just barely audible. I adjusted the radio wheel until I could hear the voices more clearly. Did, from HQ. One of the voices said, 
negative as sweeping until we go. The other voice responded. You not go back after this? The first voice asked. At this point, the voices became a lot clearer. Yeah, HQ ordered a retreat, and they'll cordon off the city. Voice 2 responded. Wait, what about the search and rescue? Voice 1 asked. Forget that. This whole town's a mess as it is. HQ said there's not going to be any more rescue attempts. Voice 2 replied. So 36 got way out of hand, huh? Voice 1 asked. Yep, it's not our problem anymore. Any survivors on your end? Voice 2 said. A couple, but they already saw too much. I had to dispose of them. Copy that. Once you're due, be sec back to base. The voice started to cut off again bit by bit and then they went completely silent, leaving me only with static. What the heck was that all about? What was 36? And what did they mean they had to dispose of the survivors and that there would be no rescue? Something was definitely wrong here and it was clear that the army knew something that us, the civilians, didn't. One thing was for sure though, I had to get out of town. I couldn't wait for rescue which wouldn't even come. Being out there with hostile soldiers, or even worse, those things that wiped out the soldiers didn't put my mind at ease, but I had no other choice. I went upstairs and I packed my bag. I put in a pair of clothes because I knew I'd probably be drenched from the rain. I also packed a flashlight and some food and water. I peeked out of my bedroom window and saw that the downpour was finally showing signs of subsiding. The streets were completely empty, save for the dead soldiers. From here, I could see across from my house that my neighbor's door was left open, allowing the wind and rain to seep inside. I tried not to think about what might have happened there and I had no intention of finding out. I put on my backpack and I approached the stairs. Not three steps down, I heard something coming from the radio, along with the static, there was the sound of a slow wheezing. I quickly went down and I grabbed the radio, putting my ear against it to hear the sound better. I tried adjusting the frequency, but no matter how much I did, nothing changed and the static and wheezing remained the same. Frustrated, I figured the radio was broken and I turned it off but the static and wheezing didn't stop. And then I saw something with the corner of my eye that made my blood run cold. Mud tracks. They were all over my carpet, coming in from the kitchen and leading to the corner of my room. I froze in place, listening as the radio static and wheezing permeated the room. After what seemed like forever, I broke out of my trance and looked towards the corner. The first thing I saw were bony feet caked with mud. As I slowly moved my gaze up, I realized I was staring at a crouched, emaciated figure, which faced the corner of my room, but I couldn't tell its features due to the dark. With extremely trembling hands, I pointed my flashlight to the corner and I flicked it on. A tiny, completely nude and emaciated humanoid creature that I could only describe as a human-like goblin came into light. Its spine was pronounced against its tight skin on the back, so much that I could count the vertebrae. Its limbs looked like they had no meat in them whatsoever, and could barely hold its fragile frame. As soon as the flashlight illuminated the creature, it jerked its head towards me with mouth wide open and scarred eyes. The radio static and wheezing got much louder, and it was just then that I realized the sound was not coming from my radio. It was all I could take. I turned around and I bolted out of there and into the rain, which had now turned into a drizzle, not even bothering to close my front door. I ran down the street, occasionally looking behind me to see if the goblin creature would come chasing me. My sprint slowed down to a jog and eventually, I stopped and I looked back towards my house, leaning on my knees and panting, listening to the sound of rain around me. I breathed a sigh of relief momentarily, and then I heard a blood-curdling scream behind me. I turned around and saw a young man who was covered in wounds all over, crawling towards me with anger in his eyes and bloodlust that I had never seen in anyone before. 
As he got closer, I realized he was missing both legs in what looked like a terrible accident, leaving only two mangled stumps, but that didn't stop him from closing in on me. I started running again, and it was just then that I realized how much these streets were actually not empty. I saw dead bodies of both civilians and soldiers. I saw crashed vehicles and more corpse-looking people crawling out despite their fatal injuries. I saw amalgamations of creatures I cannot describe in words, roaming about the streets or lying dead along with the soldiers, their dark blood staining the ground beneath them. I looked back and saw that despite my running speed, the legless man was still close behind me. I turned right and ran across the lawn, climbing over the fence and into a backyard. I stopped and stared at the fence, figuring that I was safe. There was no way the crawling man could reach me here, but a second later, he came crawling over the fence, still screaming at the top of his lungs. I started backpedaling, but slipped and fell on my back. The legless man lunged at me from a distance that would make an Olympic athlete envious, but before he could fall on top of me, he fell backwards on the grass with a loud bang. I looked to my right and saw an elderly man pointing a shotgun at the attacker. The legless man got right back up and started crawling again, until the man blasted him one more time. This time, the crawler fell backwards and writhed on the floor with a scream impossible to be made by humans before completely ceasing all movement and noise, and I was left with nothing but the sound of rain again. And then the old man cocked his shotgun once more. I looked up at him and saw that he had it trained at me, and the way his knuckles had turned white, I knew that he was ready to shoot me right there. Wait, don't shoot! I'm not one of them! I raised one hand, still sitting on the ground. Prove it, he said with a rough voice. What do you mean, prove it? I'm talking to you, aren't I? I scoffed. That don't mean shit. He spat on the ground. Look, I just left my home minutes ago because of all the crazy stuff that's happening. I have no idea what's going on, I swear. I recited in one breath. He didn't budge for a while, and the expression on his face looking like he was weighing his options. Finally, after a moment of contemplation... He lowered the gun down and gave me his hand, saying, You'll catch a cold out here, son. Let's get you inside. A young woman with cargo pants with a gun in her hand opened the back door of the old man's house. When she saw us, she stepped aside and let us in, while carefully eyeing me. Take your damn shoes off, the old man said. I don't want you tracking no mud inside. Dad, no. He might need to run out quickly in case they get inside, the girl said. Fine. The man grunted and proceeded into the living room, leaning his shotgun on the sofa where he sat. Make yourself at home, the girl said, but don't try anything stupid. She went past me and inside the living room. Everything about her confidence in verbal and body language told me that she was trained for this exact type of situation, but I didn't want to ask her anything yet. I joined them in the living room and sat opposite of the old man. Name's Harry, he said as he lit a cigarette. And this here is my daughter, Alyssa. I introduced myself as the old man kept staring at me silently. I couldn't decipher any emotions on the old man's face. You live close by, don't you? Harry asked. Yeah, a few blocks away. That creature made me get into your backyard. I didn't mean to trespass, I said. Are you headed to the hospital? Alyssa asked. No, why? I shook my head. Some survivors are gathering up there. They said so on the news before they stopped broadcasting. They're probably still there, though, Harry said. Harry, do you know anything about what's going on? I leaned forward. Devil's work, I'll tell you. Hare responded nonchalantly. Ever since they started mining two years ago, I kept telling them something would go wrong. Dad, come on, not this again. Alyssa rolled her eyes. Harry simply ignored her and continued. It ain't natural to go digging into the earth, 
wasn't meant for no humans. I can bet you they woke something up down there in that quarry. So do you know if the military has any plans for a rescue mission? I pretended not to know. I also wanted to know if Alyssa was with the army and hoped that I could get my answer this way. Something told me that if she was with the military, I would already be dead. Ain't no military coming to save us, son, Harry said. Saw them retreating with their armored vehicles and Alyssa here saw them shooting civilians on sight. Alyssa nodded. So you're not military? I asked her directly. X, she responded. I nodded and then said, So, uh, I guess our best bet is to go to the hospital, I finally said. Alyssa nodded. You could go there and wait it out, Harry said, or find the survivors there and use numbers to bust your way out of town. Hospital's close by, but there may be some of those monsters roaming around, Alyssa said. Just after a few minutes of talking to her, I could see a semblance to her father despite her not being as stubborn as Harry. I nodded and we sat in silence for a moment. Do you know anything about 36? I heard them talking over the radio about 36 getting out of hand. I finally asked. They both seemed confused, but before they could give a proper response, there was a sound of glass breaking in the kitchen, followed by a gurgling noise. Harry shot up and grabbed his shotgun while Alyssa pointed her handgun at the doorway. I saw a hatchet leaning on the side of the fireplace, so I grabbed it and got ready for whatever was coming. A moment later, the gurgling got louder and a man that looked completely charred, as if he was burnt all over, she ambled inside. When he saw us, his gurgling turned into a painful scream, which were cut short with Alyssa's bullet to the head. Another sound of glass breaking, this time behind us and another charred person, a woman jumped inside, completely ignoring the deep cuts on her body from the broken window. She started crawling towards me, and when she grabbed out of my foot, something kick-started my fight-or-flight instinct. I raised the hatchet above my head, and brought it down with full force on the woman. The blade struck the top of the woman's skull, making her stop moving completely. I didn't have time to react as another charred person stumbled in through the window, this one having patches of blazing skin on his body. I pulled the hatchet out of the woman's skull, but the man managed to grab my hand before I could swing again. A loud bang resounded, and the man fell dead from another one of Alyssa's bullets. More of them kept coming in, and the room turned into a cacophony of gunshots, and Terry's, come on you ugly son of a guns, shouts. I managed to bring down one more charred creature with a hatchet, and as I turned around, I saw that one of them tackled Alyssa to the ground and thrashed violently while she tried to free her hand of his grip and shoot him. I swung the hatchet as hard as I could, embedding it into the attacker's collarbone. He screamed an inhuman scream and fell backwards when I pulled out the blade. He started scooting back with his heels, holding his bleeding shoulder. But by this point, adrenaline took over my actions completely, so I had no intention of stopping. I gripped the hatch with both hands and brought it down on the creature over and over, first severing one of his arms at the forearm, and then finally killing him with a strike to the face. Just then I realized everything was quiet again. No gunshots, no gurgling, no swearing at Harry's end. Just the sound of our panting. I owe you... Alyssa patted me on the shoulder as she stood up. I bet you're thankful now you didn't have to take off those shoes. These goddamn assholes. Harry cursed as he reloaded his gun. You can't stay here any longer, kids. Get to the hospital. Wait, what about you? Alyssa interjected. I ain't leaving our home behind. Don't be stupid, Dad. If you stay, you'll die. I promised your mama that this would always be our home. I'm not letting these hellspawn take it away from us. You could see the disapproval in Alyssa's eyes, so he put his hand on her cheek and said, I know you're worried, baby girl, but I'll be fine. I have enough food and water to last me here for a month, and the basement is the safest place in town right now. But you need to get yourselves out of here, you understand? Hesitantly, she nodded and put her already packed backpack on. 
She and I went to the front door and Harry escorted us there. It was dark already outside, but the rain still wouldn't let up. Now remember what we talked about, he said. If the rain gets too heavy, you find cover immediately, you hear? And that's when the nasty ones come out. He lifted me and shoved a handgun in my hands. You keep my daughter safe, you hear? You keep her safe. I looked at the gun and nodded. I never used a gun before, but now it seems I would have to if I wanted to survive. Harry and Alyssa hugged it tightly for a long moment, with Harry whispering that he loved her, before she broke away hesitantly and turned around. Come on, let's go, she told me and walked down to the pavement. Thank you, Harry, for saving my life, I said, and I gave him one last look. For the first time in the short time that I knew him, I thought I finally saw an emotion on his face. An emotion which didn't suit him in the slightest. Despair. I expected Alyssa's mood to change drastically after leaving Harry behind, but she was as focused on surviving now as she was prior to that. The streets were way emptier now than they were when I first ran outside of my house. We walked in the middle of the road to avoid getting jumped from the corner even though we knew it was equally risky exposing ourselves like that. Whenever we heard an inhuman sound in the distance, Alyssa made us stop until we were sure we weren't in any danger. Walking in the rain gave us some cover, which allowed us to move relatively faster, but we still had to be careful. Wait, I whispered to Alyssa, pointing down the street. You see that? There was a little girl a few hundred yards away from us, standing in the middle of the road, facing away from us. My initial instinct was to go and see if she was okay, but based on everything I had seen by that point, I knew there was a high probability that this wasn't a little girl in distress at all. I was right because, as soon as Alyssa saw her, she cursed under her breath and pulled me aside behind a bush. What's wrong? I asked. Whatever you see there, that's not a little girl. Alyssa peeked behind the bush where we hid. Saw her or someone resembling her a bit earlier. She stood exactly like that and when a guy approached her to help during the chaos, she turned around and she had no freaking eyes or nose. Instead, her entire face was replaced by a big vertical line for her mouth with sharp teeth. The poor guy never stood a chance. So what do we do? I asked. Let's try a different street, she suggested. We snuck through our backyard, ignoring the dead bodies along the way, and went through to the adjacent street. Halfway through, I heard a pained groan coming from a dark alley to my left. I readied my hatchet, while Alyssa readied her gun. A creature crawled out into the light, barely able to pull its own weight with what was left of its human-looking arm. The thing looked like a swollen blob in its shape, barely recognizable where the head was, which I could only tell from the eye visible under the heavily swollen blisters. Some of the blisters looked volatile, pulsating under the streetlight, looking like they would pop on the slightest touch. I try not to think about whether it used to be a human, as it pathetically dragged itself towards us, groaning through the small slit of a mouth, the one visible eye wide open, and darting from Alyssa to me intermittently. Leave it, Alyssa said. It's harmless unless it manages to grab you. I saw one earlier. She holstered her gun and urged me to follow her. I gave the amalgamation of the creature one last glance before following my partner. What exactly have you seen, Alyssa? I asked while walking behind her. She was silent for a moment before responding. I got caught on the downpour while heading home. It was like a war zone. Military killing everything. Monsters of all shapes and sizes killing everything. And civilians just trying to escape. I didn't stick around to find out, since the heavy rain brought some really bad monsters. Wait, look. I pointed to graffiti on a billboard. It said, 36 will save us. You mentioned it before, right? Alessa asked. What is it? I don't know. Heard the military talking about it over the radio. Whoever or whatever it is, 
it's responsible for all the crazy stuff happening in town. We walked in silence for the rest of the way until we had reached the hospital. That's a good thing too, because the rain started to get heavier by the time that we had reached the entrance. There were no monsters in front, but when we entered, our hearts dropped at the amount of dead bodies at the front desk, both human and otherwise. Shit. Alyssa cursed quietly and readied her gun. This was a bad idea. Oh, we should get out of here, I said. As if a higher force heard me, it started raining cats and dogs again, so going outside at this point was impossible. Let's proceed carefully, Alyssa said. Maybe they barricaded themselves somewhere upstairs. We got past the reception, carefully stepping around the dead bodies. The hospital wasn't big, so we figured we would check it out quickly enough. The elevator was completely demolished, so that was out of the question. Really though, it looked as if a truck drove through it, bending the door inward all the way to the back side. We climbed the stairs to the second floor, and as soon as we did, the air became heavy. It's hard to explain, but it was as if someone had been keeping all the windows shut for a long time, making the room stuffy. There were no dead bodies, but the place was chaotic. Stretchers and trash bins had knocked over, etc. Let's split up to check each side separately, Alyssa said when we reached the end of the corridor. I'll check the patient rooms on this side, you check that one. Let's meet up here once we're done and if you see anything, scream. I wasn't exactly happy at the thought of roaming this place alone, but I hesitantly nodded and we split up. All the other rooms were empty, just like the rest of the floor. It didn't make sense. But the only possible outcome was that the survivors probably barricaded themselves on the third floor. I came back to the meeting point and then I heard Alyssa calling me from around the corner. Hey, come check this out, she said from one of the rooms. Coming, I said and I followed her voice. Just when I was about to open the door, I felt a firm grip on my left hand. I jerked my head in that direction and saw Alyssa holding my wrist, shaking her head with a worried look on her face. Don't. That's not me. She whispered with a trembling voice. My mind couldn't process what I was looking at. I stared at her and then back at the door. Hey, you still there? Alyssa's voice came from the room again, followed by an approaching set of footsteps. Come on. The Alyssa still holding my wrist pulled me into one of the adjacent rooms, where we quickly hid inside the locker. Quiet now, she whispered. A second later, the door opened, and through the cracks I saw Alyssa walking in and looking around. Damn it, where'd he go? She mumbled and turned around to leave the room. Just then, I felt the grip on my wrist tighten even more. I looked down and in the dark, I saw the hand holding it but it wasn't Alyssa's hand. The fingers which held me were bony and elongated. I looked to my left and saw not Alyssa, but a bald old man who looked like his life was way overdue by a hundred years. I felt my blood run cold and when I tried screaming, I was unable to, so I instead burst through the locker, falling on my shoulder painfully. I got up and ran outside, just in time to see Alyssa pointing her gun at me. Run! I shouted and saw her looking over my shoulder before she bolted out of the room with me. We ran to the stairs and up on the third floor, making our way past the dozens of bodies and patients, staff members, monsters, etc. A realization raced through my mind that there were no survivors, and as we reached a dead end, blocked by a makeshift barricade, we turned around to see if the old man had followed us. A second later, he climbed the stairs, striding menacingly towards us. At this point, the lights started flickering and every time they would go off and come back on, the man was much closer. Alyssa started shooting, but it was as if every time she fired a bullet, the lights would go out for a split second and the man would appear in a different spot, always a step closer. And then he finally reached us and instead of attacking us, he simply went past us. We followed him with our gaze and the lights went out again, but this time they didn't come back on. There were sounds of loud crashing and objects being thrown, 
had some moments right next to me. When the lights finally did come back after almost a whole minute, the barricade behind us was completely ransacked and the way clear. The older man was nowhere to be seen. I looked around at all the dead bodies of monsters around me and inspected the identical tattoos they all had on their wrists and whatever extensions of extremities they had. The same tattoo I saw on the old man's wrist when he held me in the locker. A simple, two-digit number. 36. We didn't have time to think about the monsters branded with the number 36, because the sound came from behind us, from the place where the barricade had previously been. We proceeded carefully past more dead bodies, and then something small ran past us in the dark. Alyssa gestured for me to follow her, and so I did. And there was nothing around the corner, but we still proceeded carefully. Whoever just ran past us was close by. Another barely audible sound coming from right behind a wheelchair in front of us. Alyssa slowly approached it, and then kicked the wheelchair aside. A small boy came into visibility. He screamed and ran past us before we could grab him. Hey, wait! We want to help you! I shouted after him, but he didn't listen. He disappeared into one of the rooms, and Alyssa and I wasted no time running after him. Little boy, where are you? Alyssa frantically looked around the room. A minute after searching, we found him under a patient's bed. I shone my flashlight and I saw his terrified face. He was no older than six and he looked like he had seen more than enough for the next 20 years. It's okay, we won't hurt you. I knelt down slowly, holding my hand in front of myself. He was panting and his eyes were wide. Hey, what's your name? I asked. He still didn't answer. My name's Alyssa. Alyssa introduced herself behind me. Where are your parents? The kid's eyes widened even more and he started backing away. It took me a moment to realize that it was not we who scared him. A faint grunting sound came from behind us, and as soon as I turned around, I saw another one of those blobby amalgamations like the one in the alley, tackling Alyssa to the ground. She held it back with her foot, trying to wiggle out of its reach. I gripped my hatchet firmly and thought for a second about what I should do. Just like the one before, the creature looked very volatile, and I didn't know how dangerous getting close could be. But when I saw how dangerously close it was to reach Alyssa's face with its deformed fingers, I brought down the hatchet on its back with full force. There was a loud popping sound, and I fell back as something warm and slimy hit my face with unimaginable force. I swiped my hand across the goo on my face and spat it out of my mouth. Hey, you okay? Alyssa helped me up. Disgusting. I spat out the rest of the slime from my mouth and I cleaned myself off. The monster lay dead sideways on the floor, its back ripped open. Just find the dang kid. I pushed Alyssa away, still disgusted. I heard her trying to talk to the boy and little by little, he finally came to trust us and let us approach him. What's your name? Alyssa asked. Dewey, he shyly said, looking at his feet. Are your parents close by, Dewey? Alyssa asked him. The kid's face turned red and his eyes glossy. Alyssa hugged him while he cried. A few minutes later, when he calmed down, she pulled back and asked him, Dewey, how did you get here? Where are the others? My mom and dad and I came here, but uh, there is a fight. Did the monsters kill them? Alyssa asked. Dewey shook his head. There is a man in black clothes. He and some other people said 36 is good, and the other people said that 36 is bad, and then they got into a fight. So the man in black and his men killed everyone, including your parents. Alyssa frowned. Dewey nodded. Do you know this man's name? Martin. Did they say where they would go? I asked. Dad said that we couldn't leave the city because the soldiers were bad. So they planned to go to the old mine where 36 was. But when Dad said that they had to get rid of 36, Martin got angry and that's when he attacked everyone. 
The old mine? Why would they go there? Alyssa asked. Hey, maybe your father was onto something after all. I smiled. What else do you remember, Dewey? Dewey thought for a moment. Martin told me I could be saved if I went with him, but I didn't want to go. A bad man was there who wanted to hurt me, but Martin said no. So they went there. There really might be something there, I said. Dewey, how many men were with Martin? Dewey counted on his fingers for a moment before responding with a simple, Six. If we take them by surprise, we can take all of them, I said. Alyssa looked uncertain, so I said, Look, chances are all exits out of town are heavily guarded by military. But if we can get to the bottom of this whole thing, we may be able to undo some of the damage and maybe even survive. She nodded and looked at the kid. Dewey, you'll have to come with us. We'll keep you safe. By the time we got out, the rain was a mere drizzle again. Since the mine was on the other side of town, we took the closest functioning car that we could find. To hell with the noise and monsters. I let Alyssa drive. Although we saw monsters on the road, most of them didn't seem to care about us. They would glance at us and then continue roaming mindlessly, as if they knew they couldn't catch us in the car. You okay, Alyssa? I asked when she got really quiet. Dewey was sleeping in the back by this point. Yeah, she said. Just thinking about my dad. You know, he used to take me to this park right here every weekend when I was a kid. No, Harry didn't seem like the gentle type. I smiled. He wasn't, she smiled back. We would do military drills there while everyone else played. You wanted to be a soldier ever since you were a kid. Yeah, and I enjoyed every second of it. You know, one time when he wasn't looking during training, I sat on the swing just for fun to take a break. Not a minute later, I fell off and I hurt myself. He saw me and when he approached me, he said, Baby girl, while you're having fun there, your enemies are training hard. And you're making it that much easier for them to kill you in combat. There's time for fun, but it's not now. Because while you're doing something, you need to do it with complete dedication. It helped me during boot camp, and after my mom passed. He said it's what helped keep him alive in war, too. I wonder if this is a little too much for him, though. Harry's tough. He could take down a whole horde of those creatures, I said. After a moment of silence, I spoke up again. You know, my father was never around. Always worked hard to provide for us. Whenever I asked to spend time with him, he said I'll thank him one day for always being busy. And then he died and I never thanked him for it. I didn't care about his money. I just wanted to spend time with him. And I never got that. It seems we both got to polar opposites, Alyssa said. Yeah, you know this one time he... I started coughing... Are you okay? She asked. Yeah, probably just caught a damn cold from this rain. I said, clearing my throat. Well, don't go getting a fever on me now. We're here, she said. She pulled over in front of a huge, fenced-off area which led to the quarry. This place is huge, she said. Where do we even start? I think I've got an idea, I said, pointing to one of the signs on the fence. There was an arrow pointing to the right side, and it said, Site 36, this way. You should probably stay with Dewey while I scout ahead, I told Alyssa. No way, she disagreed before I even finished my sentence. You'll need my help taking Martin's men down. Listen, I'm just gonna go and check. My sentence was abruptly caught off by a sudden cough. I'm gonna... <coughs> Scout and <coughs> come back and <coughs> soon. Hey, are you okay? Alyssa looked at me suspiciously. I'm fine, I said and I cleared my aching throat. What's going on? Dewey said groggily. Sorry to wake you up there, buddy, I said. Listen, Alyssa softly said. We're gonna go find the bad man. We need you to stay here, okay? Dewey was less than enthused by this, 
So Alyssa went on to explain why we needed him to stay quietly in the car while we checked out the mine. After a few minutes of convincing, he finally agreed when Alyssa told him that his job is to keep the car safe, deeming it an extremely important task. We'll be back soon, okay? I told him and smiled reassuringly. As soon as we had closed the car doors behind us, Alyssa took point and carefully proceeded on the old dirt road leading to the quarry. The place seemed to be deserted, not counting the dozens of dead bodies of both humans and monsters. The rain still wasn't letting up, and my guess was it wouldn't for a long, long time. We followed the arrow signs 236 until we started hearing faint noises in the distance. The cacophony of screams, growls, and moans was definitely coming from numerous monsters, but we couldn't see in the dark where they were. We followed the only remaining path to sight at 36, with the noise getting louder and louder. We finally reached an opening and it didn't take us long to realize we were at the edge of the quarry itself. The noise was coming from the direct center and when we looked in that direction, we gasped. Hundreds, no thousands of monsters were converging on top of each other like a huge swarming pile. Monsters of all shapes and forms, forming a nightmarish abomination of a mountain. Although a lot of the stray ones looked in our direction, they didn't seem too concerned about us, but we tried not to make any sudden moves nevertheless. Look, entrance 36. Alyssa pointed at the distance. It looks like we have to go around them, I said. I don't think they'll hurt us, but let's be really careful and keep our distance. I took point this time, and just as I had predicted, the monsters weren't aggressive, despite making eye contact with us. Still, we proceeded carefully around the horrid, keeping as far away as we could from the big pile. The mountain of monsters was a lot bigger and louder than I thought when we got closer to it, and it became clear that the monsters were constantly falling and climbing and falling, over and over and over. Entering the dark mine labeled as 36 fell to claustrophobic, but also relieving to leave the army of monsters behind. Carefully, Alyssa whispered, pointing her torch in front of us. The mine was pretty straightforward, and we ran into no trouble, until we heard the voices, that is. Wait, you hear that? I perked up my ears. Bring him forward. A deep voice echoed through the mind. No, please. I never questioned you, Father, please. Another voice pleaded. Alyssa and I peeked around the corner and saw a group of men standing in an open area in front of a big tunnel. Two of the men were tightly holding a third one who was struggling. You have sinned, my child, but you can still be saved. The deep voice said again. It was a priest. That was definitely Martin. Father, please. The man pleaded. But before he could say anything more, Martin slid a shiny blade across his throat. The man fell over with a gurgling sound, clawing at his throat and bleeding to death within seconds. Martin raised his arms high up and shouted, Glory be to the 36, savior of our world. The men around him did the same. I counted the men surrounding him. Aside from Martin, there were four other men, all of them armed with assault rifles. We can take them, Alyssa whispered. I nodded and just as we were about to jump out and start shooting, another voice shouted. Father Martin, we found an intruder outside our holy grounds. He's the one from the hospital. Father Martin looked down at the new prisoner and chuckled before saying, Well now, it would seem you changed your mind about coming here. Have you not, do we? My heart jumped into my throat when I glanced there and realized that they had the little boy as a prisoner. Dewey stared at Martin, visibly frightened, but not wanting to show it to the priest. Luckily, we have just the job for you in a few days, Martin continued. Take him to the sores, lock him up, and keep a close eye on him. Before I realized what was going on, Alyssa jumped in front of our enemies and started shooting them with an expression of pure anger on her face. Without any time to think, I joined in and in the frenzied shootout, we managed to take down all but one of Martin's men, who fled into the dark tunnel ahead. My shoulder got grazed by a bullet in the shootout, but I was not seriously injured. Martin, come out here! 
Alyssa took a few steps forward cautiously. Out of nowhere, he jumped out and shot Alyssa in the leg, while standing behind Dewey, pointing a gun to his head. Not a step closer or the child dies, Martin said. I held my gun trained at him, not sure what I should do. Shoot him, Alyssa shouted. I would have done it too, but all of a sudden, my vision became blurry and I got dizzy, coughing violently. I felt myself falling to my knees and saw blood coming out of my mouth with each cough. Everything was getting dark. Father Martin, are you okay? More men rushed to Martin's side, pointing their guns at Alyssa and me. Should we throw them in the pit? One of them asked. No. Martin said while standing over me. They're as good as dead anyway. The next few hours were blurry. I fell in and out of consciousness and I remember seeing an unfamiliar face. A scientist of some sort. I felt being carried and I remember seeing a bright room. Sometime later I woke up. It took me a while to adjust but when I did, I shielded my eyes from the bright ceiling light. I looked around and realized I was in some sort of lab. A man in a white coat sat on the other side of the room by a PC, typing away. Various vials and incubators of sorts with unfamiliar organs were on the desks around the room. I shuffled on the bed and started coughing violently. Breathe, breathe. The man in the white coat was next to me before I even knew it. Who are you? I asked. My name is Dr. Andrew. I work in this lab. Lab? An electronic door opened and a woman with a crutch waltzed in. Finally awake, Alyssa smiled. Her leg was wrapped in a blood-soaked bandage where she had been shot. Alyssa, what happened? They took Dewey. I think they planned to sacrifice him. Dr. Andrew saw us on these surveillance cameras and took us into the lab. The government had this whole underground facility set up to study 36. Where is the kid now? I asked. They took him all the way deep into the heart of 36, Andrew said, to where the monsters are emerging from. Then we need to go save him. I stood up on wobbly legs, trying to steady myself. Alyssa sat down with a serious expression on her face. The dog stared at me with concern, too. What? I asked. There is something you should know. Alyssa looked down. Back when you saved me in the hospital, when you killed that volatile creature, there was a long pause. Well, what is it? My heart was racing and my body trembling. I'm afraid you're infected. Andrew finally spoke up. The good news is it's not contagious and it doesn't turn you into one of those creatures. It seems to be a new form of bacteria which we've never seen before. So, here comes the bad news. Once infected, the bacteria attaches itself to the lungs of the host and... Save the BS, Doc, I said quietly. How long do I have? It's hard to say. Judging by the progress of the bacteria, I'd say less than a week. I chuckled, unable to process what I was hearing. After a long pause, I said, You said they took Dewey all the way deep, right? Alyssa interjected. You can't be serious. You can't. I'm the only one who can save him. I tried not to yell too much, since my chest was burning. You can't do it with that leg of yours, so it has to be me. I have to do this one last thing before I die. Although the lab was enormous and had lots of staff, Andrew was the only one who had managed to survive. He explained when the alarm went off. All military personnel went to secure the source on site at 36, but they perished. Andrew had no choice but to initiate a full lockdown. So what exactly is at 36? I asked. Well, Andrew started. It all began as an accident. Some miners were going about their business and one day, they dug through to this hidden cave system, so to say, which further led down to a huge, seemingly bottomless hole. Now at first it was just an interesting tourist attraction, but then people reported hearing voices coming from down there. And then the first accident happened. 
You remember that little girl that disappeared a few years back? Katie Chandler. Alyssa interjected. Yeah. The official story was she just went missing during a field trip to the cave with her school. But in reality, she fell down the hole. Well, the drag down is more accurate. Wait, the teacher who took the class on the field trip claimed there was no way she fell inside the hole. I said. Andrew nodded. Yeah, as soon as the incident happened, the teacher was bribed and threatened by the government. The kids' stories of monsters were, of course, dismissed. We had our eyes on this place for a while as a precaution, but only after we saw Katie getting dragged down were our suspicions confirmed. After that, the military quarantined the zone. Our lab was set up here and we have been studying the hole ever since. The public was told the area was closed off due to police searching for the missing girl. But something went wrong, Alyssa asked. Monsters occasionally kept emerging from the cave. We tried investigating the hole, but it was impossible. It was as if a completely different world was down there. And then they stopped coming out altogether. But the government wanted to know more about them, so they set up a special machine to draw them out. What? They created a link with the world down there via a machine. Let's call it a portal. But they underestimated the monsters and soon thousands of them poured out of the portal and were set loose on the city. So, what about the rain? Interestingly enough, as the rain increases, so does the activity in the portal. We still don't know how they're connected, but one thing is for sure. The heavier the rain, the more dangerous they are. Doc, on our way here, the creatures outside were merging onto a big pile and they weren't hostile towards us, I said. Yes, the creatures seem to be operating in hive-like mind manner, and whatever is controlling them seems to be coming from the source, the portal. We believe they have a queen or something of the like. So how do we stop them? Your best bet is to destroy the machine. It's very fragile so a few bullets should do it. But that still leaves the monsters outside, Alyssa said. Andrew nodded. Yes, and if the machine is destroyed, there may be a number of residual monsters coming out of the hole. The ones that managed to get into our world before the connection is severed. And chances are, the government will either nuke the city to prevent it from spreading. But if we close the portal, the monsters may get confused without the connection to their leader. I can then contact HQ when they may conduct a full sweep and rescue mission. What are those creatures anyway? I asked. Well, we don't know exactly. Our research team believes they were dormant for centuries and those miners woke them up when they dug up their sanctuary. We studied a few specimens, but we still know barely anything about them. There was a long silence. Well, it's time for me to go. I stood up. Wait, to take this. Andrew went to his desk and returned with a box of pills. It'll suppress the bacteria, but only for a very short time. Take one every hour and no sooner. The strain is highly adaptive and can develop resistance within days. Thanks, Doc. My mind was on autopilot and I tried not to think about the fact that my time on this earth was limited. Alyssa stood up with the help of her crutch and opened her mouth to say something, but I could tell she had no idea what to say. There was nothing she could say to ease the situation. Don't worry, I said. I'll bring him back and then you need to keep him safe. I will, I promise, she said with glossy eyes. I coughed painfully and then said to her, You know, I planned on asking you out on a date once this was all done. Despite being stubborn, I think we would get along. If you weren't so ugly, I'd say yes, she said and we both laughed. I stared at the ground and then looked her in the eye. If I'm not back soon... You'll have to go on alone. She didn't respond. The doctor escorted me out of the lab. He gave me an assault rifle which belonged to one of the soldiers and told me how to reach the source where the machine was. The lab itself was hidden behind a fake wall which could be raised and lowered. So that explained how the dock stayed safe this whole time. I stepped outside and turned back to the dock. If you make it back, I'll see you on the camera feed and open the passage for you. 
Good luck. Andrew said and pushed a button which lowered the fake wall back down, leaving me in the empty mine. Hold on, Dewey. I said to myself and started walking. I soon reached the area where we first saw Father Martin, and from there, I went inside the dark tunnel ahead. It slowly descended and as it did, the air got colder, until I could see my breath in the air. After I started having a coughing fit, I popped one of the pills and continued, trying to steady my breathing. I felt fatigue taking me over, so I knew I was almost out of time. When I descended to the bottom, I started seeing lights from torches on the walls. As I continued, the rock walls and floor changed into a metallic corridor. I followed the only path ahead of me until I heard voices in front. It was a mixture of adult and child voices. I hurried up and saw in front of me a huge area with a tall ceiling and an enormous hole in the ground. The hole was glowing brightly and looked like it had some sort of whirlpool in it. On the other side of it was a big, generator-like machine. This was definitely the place that I was looking for. I arrived just in time to see Martin and his man throw a woman into the hole. Her scream was abruptly cut off when she fell inside the vortex, which became turbulent before calming down again. Praise be to 36. Martin raised his arms and shouted. The men around him repeated the phrase three more times. Now do we... Martin turned towards the kid. Your role is at hand. You will perform a great deed. Here. No! Dewey spewed at Martin, making him and a few other men chuckle. Come now. Martin pushed Dewey towards the hole and stepped back. Dewey fell near the edge on his hands and knees and stared at the vortex, which started to become violent again. I aimed my gun at the generator. It was far away, but I was confident that I could hit it. Black tentacles started to emerge from the hole and slither their way towards Dewey as a deep groan echoed from the hole itself all around the cave. Without any time to think, I pulled the trigger. The bullet hit the machine with a loud clank and the sound of electric shocks filled the air. The vortex in the hole disappeared just like that and the tentacles writhed, severed in the ground, purple blood oozing out of them. The deep ground from before turned into a scream of agony, and the cave began to shake. No! What did you do? Martin shouted. Multiple screams came from the now dark hole, and monsters started to emerge. They wasted no time pulling Martin's men into the hole, or slaughtering them on sight. Most of his men had already escaped. Some deeper into the cave and others ran past me, ignoring me in their panic. Come back, you cowards! Martin shouted as screams echoed around him. Dewey, come on! I shouted in the whole mess and the boy started running towards me. A thin creature with sharp claws and teeth pursued him on all fours, and just as it had leapt to grab him, I shot the creature and knocked it backwards. It didn't move again. Come on! I pushed Dewey forward and we both ran as quickly as our legs and the shaking ground allowed us to. We ran unsteadily through the tremors, and I heard cavens behind us. My chest was on fire and I was already out of breath. Dewey, run! I said between breaths and continued staggering. And then I felt a powerful force knock the air out of me. I dropped the gun and I fell to my side. You'll pay for that, Martin said as he punched me over and over. He then put his hands around my throat and started choking me. You ruined everything, he said squeezing so hard that my vision got darker by the second. I'll kill you for what you've done. I raised my hands and punched Martin at the forearms as hard as I could, making his grip loosen. I then coughed up some blood in his face and kicked him away from me with the remaining strength. I turned around on my stomach and started crawling towards the gun on the ground. No, you don't. Martin said from behind and I felt myself getting dragged back by my feet. I turned back around to see him holding a big rock above his head. I raised my hands in defense and a loud bang ensued. Martin dropped the rock and a large red stain appeared on his chest. He stared at me in disbelief before finally falling down dead. Rot in hell, Alyssa said holding the gun with Dewey behind her. Come on, let's go. 
She sat and held me up as much as she could with her bad leg. The scream started to fill the air again behind us. We ran back inside the lab and Andrew closed the secret passage, just in time for the monsters to slam into the impregnable wall. I fell on my knees, coughing violently. When I finally stopped, I felt weaker than ever, so much that I could barely stand. I lay on the bed while Andrew contacted HQ via radio. A few minutes later, he got a response and the military confirmed they would eliminate the remaining monsters and perform a search and rescue immediately. You did it. Alyssa told me as she held my hand, but I couldn't respond since I fell out of consciousness. I woke up sometime later on the same bed. Alyssa and a bunch of doctors were around me. Good, he's stable now. Is he going to be okay? Alyssa asked. I looked around and saw military people talking to Andrew and more doctors walking around the lab. If we had have arrived a few minutes late, he would have been dead, the doctor said. He can never be rid of the infection, but the bacteria will remain dormant as long as he takes the medication. You have to keep a close eye on him, and if there is even the slightest change... I know, I'll take care of him, she said. The doctors left and Alyssa sat next to me with a big smile and squeezed my hand. Hey, you hear that? You're gonna be alright. I closed my eyes and I squeezed back. There was no news coverage about the incident, and all rescued survivors were forced to sign an NDA about the whole deal, under the threats of incarceration and even execution. The official reported story was that there was a virus outbreak, which had since been contained, despite the numerous casualties. Months later, I live a normal life, albeit with a lower lung capacity. And Dewey lives with his aunt now, but Alyssa and I make sure to visit him every week. Everyone else seems to be back living their old mundane life too, and no one talks about the rain incident. One thing still bothers me though. Whenever it rains, I always hear something when I'm home. Something that puts me on edge and takes me back to the day when the whole incident started. Something that's always just loud enough for me to hear, no matter what I'm doing or where I am in my house. The unmistakable sound of footsteps splashing in my backyard. <laughs>